Hello, and thank you for taking the time to watch. Today, I'd like to tell you a quick story of the Tempe syndrome, which I've dubbed the story of one curious and stubborn physician scientist. Now, the Tempe syndrome is an ultra rare disease, and it's characterized by these five hallmark features. Patients develop telangic tasias, usually on their face and over their upper torso. They have very high elevated levels of erythropoietin and erythrocytosis. They have a monoclonal gammopathy, an antibody, which is produced in very high levels in the bloodstream. They develop fluid around their kidneys called perinephric fluid. And they actually run into troubles breathing and oxygenating their blood because of intrapulmonary shunting. And the story started back in 2008 when a gentleman from Memphis, Tennessee showed up to the Fellows Clinic in Boston as a fourth opinion. And this is where things got very interesting. Ultimately, this ended up getting published as an unknown case, a case without a diagnosis in 2010 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And at the time, um, you can see here that I was a, not an author, but I presented the case as the fellow. And I had appealed to Nancy Harris, who was editor at the time, that she put a little line, a sentence right at the end of the report, asking that if any reader with thoughts or anybody who'd seen similar patients, please reach out to me. And within a week of publication of that New England Journal of Medicine case report, I got two uh, emails, one from Casey O'Connell at the University of Southern California, and one from Dr. Wilfred Schroens from the University of Antwerp in Belgium. And they had the exact same patients with the exact same undiagnosed condition. And this really spawned then uh, what's become an international effort. Uh, and then in 2011, we actually published um, uh, the finding of this is a new disease, a new disease entity that we uh, dubbed the acronym TEMPI. And from there, um, we then moved on to start to ask the real question, which was now that we've got what looks like um, a bona fide disease, what is the cause of the Tempe syndrome? And maybe even more to the point, um, can we treat it? What, is the, what can we do to treat it? The second question actually came easiest. And as a group of us and then uh, other people discussing these patients who became progressively more debilitated from their breathing point of view, uh, we made the move to treat them. And here we used a plasma cell directed therapy under the hypothesis that it was actually the antibody causing it. And actually we had complete resolution of symptoms. And uh, this lady who was in Belgium was uh, on 24 hour oxygen. And then within really weeks to months of starting the treatment was back to riding her bike around Belgium. It was really remarkable. Complete resolution of the telangiectasias, complete resolution of the perinephric fluid, normalization of the erythropoietin, loss of the monoclonal um, gammopathy, and loss of the intrapulmonary shunt. Uh, then, of course, you know, now we're you know, almost uh, eight years, nine years later, after identifying the disease, the World Health Organization classification picked it up uh, as Tempe syndrome and put it in as a provisional entity in 2017. Now it's a, a full entity. Uh, then we started making it to the uh, recognized in some of the review articles in terms of um, when you should look out for the Tempe syndrome. And all of a sudden now we have 25 patients worldwide. And this has really been a remarkable sort of just, you know, fun effort. Um, I probably get two phone calls uh, a year where people think they have uh, a new uh, case of Tempe syndrome. And we've now started sort of an international banking effort trying to um, understand really what is the underlying cause of this. And I'd love to spend an hour talking to you about what we've been doing in the lab. But the hypothesis, again, it is this antibody, this monoclonal gammopathy, which is triggering the other symptoms. And again, we think this is the case because of the remarkable response and complete resolution of these symptoms when we can eradicate the antibody. And so it's now been sort of a <clears throat> more than 10 year labor of love that I'd like to say for is uh, born from one stubborn and curious physician scientist. Um, and then maybe not to overstate it, but this was really a research informed by a single patient and then by multiple patients. I think it gives the idea that it is an ultra rare disease, which can then lead to fundamental insights into biology, what triggers um, erythropoietin production uh, at that level. We can learn from nature's mistakes. Um, and then it really speaks to something that, you know, you don't have outside of the physician scientist, which is the ability to have a real trusting relationship. The patients have been so uh, understanding, trusting, understanding that we're treating them with with uh, medications designed for other diseases. And those relationships over, over the last years have been so important to, to really advance the science. 
And then just a really fun story of international collaboration, literally, you know, getting calls. And we had a small symposium in San Diego at hematology meeting where we brought together people over dinner just to discuss and see if people had insights. Uh, so obviously I'm presenting this on behalf of a lot of different people. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to watch. And I hope this really reinforces how the, um, you know, you've got certainly MDs, wonderful researchers, certainly PhDs, uh, and the same thing, but there is still a role for that physician scientist to go back from the bench to the bedside to bring patients right into the laboratory. Uh, thanks again. Thank you for taking the time to watch our video, and thank you for your continued support of physician scientists. To write your senator or representative, please go to this link. Below the main message, please write, increase support for physician scientists bridge funding and grants. Thank you.